There's always a huge temptation in videos about nuclear fusion to quote the hackneyed old cliche that it's a technology that's only 20 years away and always will be. No doubt many of you have heard the cliche phrase that nuclear fusion is just 20 years away and always will be. So I promise you this time I definitely will not be using the cliche that nuclear fusion is only 20 years away and always will be. Because to be completely honest, I'm not actually sure the picture is even quite as optimistic as that. There's been a lot of press interest in apparently major breakthroughs in nuclear fusion recently. And just to be clear, no one would be more delighted than me to see commercially viable electricity generation from fusion power become a reality. Because if it did, it would pretty much solve the world's energy and resource scarcity problems in one fell swoop. So, you know, I do see the appeal, don't get me wrong. The slight wrinkle is that the whole structure for gauging how well the various research centres are progressing appears to be built on what a cynical person might describe as willful mass delusion. So what's going on? Hello, and welcome to Just Have a Think. It's a very compelling story, isn't it, the whole nuclear fusion thing? The dream is to reproduce the reaction that happens inside our own sun, where lighter elements like hydrogen and its isotopes of deuterium and tritium are converted into heavier elements like helium. As the nuclei of these lighter elements are fused together, they emit neutrons and very large quantities of energy. We're talking about energy levels about 10 million times greater than we can currently achieve by burning fossil fuels. Nuclear fusion is in fact the process by which all elements in the universe were created in the first place. Which is why that nice man, Mr Moby, tells us we're all made of stars. We are all made of stars. Lovely. In theory, by replicating that process in a controlled environment here on Earth, you could get a relatively cheap and essentially unlimited amount of energy without any greenhouse gas emissions and with only a tiny fraction of the radioactive nuclear waste produced by the global nuclear fission industry today. And all of this coming from good old H2O. According to the Dutch high energy physicist L.J. Reinders, who produced this mammoth 900 page tome, there's an awful lot of hydrogen's heavier isotope deuterium in our oceans. To be more precise, one in every 6,420 atoms of hydrogen is deuterium and it can be literally scooped up, isolated and utilised. As Reinders points out, no mines are needed, no transport of fuel to power stations will be required because you'll just build your power plant close to every coastline where your water supply will be effectively infinite. And the fact that the fusion process itself produces no greenhouse gas emissions means it could be the perfect solution to our present day climate emergency. Almost sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? And that's because it quite probably is. The best funded experimental fusion reactors in operation today use designs known as Tokamak and Stellarator. They're both examples of what's called magnetic confinement technology. The International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, has been in development since 1985. When construction work is finally completed in the latter half of this decade, it'll be the biggest Tokamak machine on the planet. It originally had a budget of 5 billion euros, but it's now looking like it'll burn its way through more like 25 billion, with no guarantee of a successful outcome. It's basically a bunch of incredibly strong magnets that contain a huge donut shaped stream of superheated plasma. The plasma is contained and compressed by the magnets until the nuclei fuse together and release their energy as heat. That heat then gets trapped in a specially created blanket that sits around the reaction chamber. Then theoretically, it's just a matter of piping that heat into water to create steam that goes across a turbine and drives a generator that makes electricity. Sounds quite straightforward in principle, but applying those principles to the real world has proven to be anything but easy. First of all, getting plasma up to a temperature that's many times hotter than the surface of the sun and keeping those streams of plasma in place long enough for the fusion reactions to take place is extremely challenging. China holds the current temperature record with their experimental advanced superconducting tokamak, or EAST, which in 2021 reached 160 million degrees Celsius. That's more than 10 times hotter than the sun's core. So, you know, pretty impressive. But they only managed it 
for 20 seconds and the power required to achieve it was enormous, which is something we'll come back to in a moment. In late December 2021, another experimental tokamak device called the Joint European Taurus, or JET, near Oxford in the UK, achieved what they claimed to be the highest sustained energy pulse ever created. Using a fuel made of equal parts deuterium and tritium, the JET tokamak produced 59 megajoules of energy over a 5 second fusion pulse. That's about enough energy to boil 60 kettles, and it's twice the amount they achieved in their last record breaking attempt back in 1997. But that was 25 years ago, so it's taken all this time to achieve that small incremental level of progress. The experiment achieved a ratio of energy out to energy in, which the fusion community refer to as Q, of 0.33 over the five second interval. And to be clear, that means the energy they got out was only one third of the energy they put in. And the Q they were referring to was specifically Q plasma, which in nuclear fusion speak, means the ratio of energy going into plasma to energy coming out of plasma. It doesn't account for any other energy requirements for the overall system, which is something else we'll come back to later. You may well also have seen an announcement in 2021 from the US Department of Energy's National Ignition Facility, who used a different technique called inertial confinement using laser energy instead of the magnetic confinement technique used in tokamaks. They achieved a Q plasma of 0.7. It was big news at the time and the fusion community was very excited by what they saw as a significant breakthrough. It meant that 70% of the energy that went into the plasma came out again as a result of the fusion reaction. Okay, so that's getting another step closer to one for one, right? Well, not really, because we're only still talking about the energy in the plasma, not the entire system and the pulse lasted for less than four billionths of a second. So I wouldn't go trying to switch your energy supply to fusions R us just yet. Part of the problem is that as well as keeping them incredibly hot, you also need to keep your plasma particles moving in the right direction. The magnetic field in a tokamak's donut shape is stronger in the middle and weaker at the edges. So there's a tendency for particles to drift off course and hit the containment walls. And once that happens, the reaction is over. Stellarator reactors are an attempt to overcome this problem. Open up one of these devices and you'll find the weirdly contorted twists of its vacuum chamber and containment magnets. It's a shape so complicated that it had to be designed on a supercomputer at the Max Planck Institute in Germany and welded together by precision computer guided robots. There are 50 magnet coils in here, each containing over a kilometer of superconducting cable weighing six tons designed specifically to force particles through regions of high and low magnetic fields, so that in theory, the effects of the two cancel each other out and keep the plasma away from the containment walls. But whichever design you look at, the fact is that firing up and running all the components of these systems requires a massive amount of auxiliary power, which is not reflected in that Q plasma number we just looked at. So to truly consider how close the fusion bods are getting to a machine that can actually produce useful electricity that you and I can use to make a cup of tea, you have to look at what's called Q-total. Sabina Hossenfelder is a physics PhD and research fellow at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies in Germany. She also runs a YouTube channel called Science Without the Gobbledygook, which no doubt many of you are already subscribed to. Sabina made a brilliant video back in October 2021 explaining the whole Q thing. So if you want the deep dive, then I'll leave a link to that video in the description box below. In very basic terms though, if you're an investor looking to build a commercially profitable power plant, then you obviously need to know the total amount of energy required by the entire system compared to the total amount of usable electricity your system will send into the grid. That's where Q total comes in. It takes into account all the power required to run, cool and maintain the enormous magnets and all the other electrical and control systems that keep the reaction going. It also factors in the efficiency of converting heat into steam and driving the electrical generator, which is likely to be somewhere around 50%. The ITER reactor that we looked at earlier is designed to have a power generation capacity of 500 megawatts when it's completed. And the team claim to be aiming for a Q plasma of 10, which is more than 14 times greater than anything anyone has so far achieved. 
But according to their head of electrical engineering, the whole system would actually require 440 megawatts of input power to achieve a fusion generation capacity of 500 megawatts. So the Q total in that case would be 500 over 440, which is about 1.14. Now that's not earth shattering, but it's still better than break even, right? Well, no, because we still have to apply that heat to electricity conversion efficiency of 50%. So now we're down to a Q total of 0 0.57. So even assuming that ITER does indeed one day achieve its goals, which by the way, it's nowhere close to even after 37 years of hard work, then it'd still be consuming almost twice as much energy as it produces. And if we apply all those numbers to the headline grabbing Q plasma of 0 0.7 that the US National Ignition Facility announced last year, even if their lasers were measurably more efficient than magnetic containment methods of tokamaks and stellarators, you're still left with a Q total that's almost certainly going to be far less than 0 0.1. And here's another little reality check that I doubt the fusion bods are keen to trumpet from the rooftops. Just using deuterium to drive the fusion reaction doesn't cut the mustard. To reach even the modest numbers we've looked at today, fusion reactors have to add tritium to the mix, like I mentioned earlier with the European jet facility. The combination of tritium and deuterium results in a far higher production of neutrons from the fusion reaction. But tritium is not abundantly available like deuterium. It's much rarer and much more expensive. And unlike deuterium, it's dangerously radioactive. If full-scale commercial fusion reactors ever came into existence, then to get enough tritium to make the reaction work, they'd need to breed it in the reactor by allowing some of the neutrons created by the fusion reaction to smash into atoms of another element, like lithium, within the walls of the blanket that surrounds the fusion reactor. Then there would have to be some way of extracting that newly created tritium from the blanket and feed it back into the reactor, all without disrupting the magnets or the flow of the plasma. Two small problems with that idea. Firstly, it's never actually been demonstrated to work in the real world. And secondly, splitting atoms is not a nuclear fusion process, it's a nuclear fission process. That inevitably means that any prospective new fusion power plant of the future would be subject to all the same tortuous and time-consuming regulatory constraints that tend to cause such costly overruns in today's nuclear fission power plants. I have to say, I really do admire the tenacity and dedication of the research scientists striving to achieve the ultimate energy solution for our planet. And I really do hope that one day in the future, our descendants will enjoy the fruits of their labor. But it looks very unlikely to happen in my lifetime and right now we've got eight years to wean ourselves off fossil fuels, so I can't help wondering whether the tens of billions of dollars being pumped into fusion research around the world might be better spent on more immediate solutions that are already in place and well proven. Now I'm quite sure that many of you will have your own very strong views on the subject of nuclear fusion and they may well differ from mine, so if you do, then as always, feel free to jump down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. That's it for this week though. Thanks as always to our fantastic Patreon supporters who keep these videos ad free and completely independent. If you'd like to support my work, exchange ideas and information with like-minded folks, watch my exclusive monthly news updates, and tell me which subjects I should be talking about next by taking part in monthly content polls, then you can find out how to do exactly that by visiting patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And of course, the best and easiest way you can support the channel via YouTube completely for free is by clicking the subscribe button and hitting the notification bell. It makes a massive difference to how the channel's videos are picked up by YouTube and it's dead easy to do. You just need to click down there or on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.